All right, welcome back to the final hour of Green Rush Live here on a Friday afternoon on Pro Cannabis Media. We're here every Friday from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time, which thankfully I figured out Pacific Time is three hours earlier so that I can actually reach out to some people we know on the West Coast, like Josh Kincaid out in Washington State. And now we're bringing in somebody else from Washington State. His name is Bruce Barcott, and he is a, uh, I, can, I guess I have to call you a former editor of Leafly.com. Is, is that where we're at right now, Bruce? That's where we're at, Jimmy. Yeah, absolutely. I am uh, footloose and fancy free now after uh, seven good years at Leafly. Yeah, and you did a great job. I mean, you know, I'm a big fan. I've read the book, Weed the People, and I actually have it as required reading for people who want to learn about the space that we're in now. Um, Bruce, as you look back at those seven years and you look back at Washington State, uh, you know, there's a lot of doom and gloom and reality going on right now in the cannabis space. We just spent a lot of time with Michael Correa from Washington, D.C., and talking a lot about uh, the, the challenges of getting any kind of federal reform. Are you amazed that we're still growing at this point? I mean, it's you'd think the green rush happened early. There was cannabis 1.0 and then there was 2.0. And are we at like 3.0 yet? Or are we still kind of trying to get through the 2.0? I think, honestly, I think we're still trying to get through the 2.0. I think of 1.0 as being, you know, really... Uh, what do we want to say, 20, 2014 through 2021, maybe, mm -hmm. yeah. um, with a little uh, ancillary boost from the from the pandemic. Um, but I, I do think we're in a, uh, you know, a, a settling period, a, a falling out period right now, where um, a lot of the hope and um, uh, over exuberance that went into the cannabis legalization movement and then the industry and rightly so for so many reasons um, has settled down and and I think that uh, a lot of people for many many years you know viewed cannabis as the next tech in terms of the financial possibilities there in terms of people coming in and you know making a billion dollars with a B. Um, and, you know, we can go in many directions talking about that, but I think the reality is that, and people are seeing this now, is that it is a hard business to turn a buck in. You know, there's parts of this that are agriculture, there's parts of this that are just plain retail, and um, it doesn't, you know, scale in the way that, that Facebook um, might scale. You still have to p sell a person a joint or a gram or an ounce face to face, you know? Right. Oh no, ab absolutely, and and I and we were talking about earlier is I think the government, both at the federal, state, and town level, have done an amazing job of putting so many elements and levels in to really test the passion and commitment of the industry and try to do everything they possibly can to either break the industry or really thin the herd before it even becomes a herd. Yeah, and you know one of the the things that that we've seen um, play out is you know there's this this great tension between uh, the MSOs, the large players who have have stores and operations in in many states across the U.S., you know, versus the local local players, the local people who are trying to get up a small farm, who are trying to get up a, a you know a sim a single retail store, uh, and you know there's there is um, there's a way in which you know, many governments are trying to build in uh, opportunities for small operators, for entrepreneurs, especially people of color who have been harmed by the war on drugs, this sort of thing. But there's a way in which also there those those efforts are being undermined by the um, uh, overzealousness of a lot of the rules that are going in on the state level and a local level. You know, essentially, you know, we see this most commonly with the so-called opt-out towns that don't allow any businesses in mm -hmm. their in their district. Um, but also, you know, the the onerousness of a lot of state regulations and then the simple fact of taxes, of that IRS rule that just mm -hmm. slays any notion of profit um, every year. It's a right. tough one. 
So Bruce, with that, you're talking about 280E, I'm assuming yeah. not being able to write off stuff. Yesterday, I, I think it was yesterday, like last night, um, I saw something about the banking act or you know safe banking mm -hmm. uh in in dc getting i forget what the term is it got pushed up or whatever and it's the first time in a while that that it's anything has been given um that kind of priority which indicates i guess um a significant drive or interest in order to get something done not just placating the audience but like truly trying to get something done so between banking and this is a this is a three part um, choose your own uh, solution. Here. All right, what's going to be what's going to be the biggest drive for the industry? Is it going to be two eighty e that you just mentioned with taxes? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be banking or is it going to be interstate commerce? Who? Oh. I know the answer. Oh, you you know the answer, huh, Jimmy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I I think um, you know if you ask me if, if, to pick one. Let's say, right? Um, I, I have a choice of three and I can pick one. Um honestly, I would I would pick interstate commerce. Yep. yep. I, I really would. We are I, the I United that, States of America, after yeah, all, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, this this I this 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 artificial bordering of states that we do and forcing people to grow cannabis in New Jersey. Um, where while at, while at the same time, you know, Oregon is just like drowning in cannabis plants, you know, uh, and you know, California to 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 a certain extent as well. Um, I think that really could even things out uh, quite a bit and and help right the ship in terms of making the national cannabis industry a more logical industry where people who have the resources to grow and the sunshine and the soil can grow and just go bananas and then put it on a truck and ship it across the country. Right. We, I think we, it's held back the industry a lot. And in, in terms of how COVID sped the sped up the global landscape about 10 years for a lot of things, specifically in our industry, delivery, um, mm -hmm. e-commerce, uh, things of that nature, like it, it sped up a lot. Um, and, and hopefully um, that that'll kind of continue uh, in that in that direction. Um, is there anything that you see that could could propel that any quicker? I'm not sure because you know I think that that uh, for the last two years, um, un you know, until uh, the House turned over to Republicans, there was this great hope that safe banking, at least safe banking, would pass, if not full federal legalization. And then, you know, when when nothing happened and the House went over to the Republicans, and I really don't expect anything to come out of uh, of the House uh, in a positive way in terms of, of drug reform or cannabis legal reform, um, I, I think there's a sort of a feeling of retrenchment and, and a feeling that, okay, this is kind of what we're set with, I think, for the next couple of years, and we're going to have to work within these guidelines. Um, and unfortunately, that has led to other sort of ancillary repercussions. Um, that realization, I think, scared a lot of investment money away, um, which has made it much harder um, for a number of companies to, you know, either stay afloat and make payroll or just to get to get started. Um, there's not that uh, kind of crazy money available that we saw uh, four or five, six years ago. And I think it's interesting because the whole movement was designed to um, legalize and get rid of the illicit market, okay, or at least uh, uh, minimize it. And it, it has had, had the exact opposite effect because of the bureaucracy, because of these issues. And it's also another reason why I think you're starting to see states making deals with each other out there on the west coast for interstate commerce you know it's like why do we need to wait around if you're out in oregon washington and california let's just share what we have out here on the west coast and again it makes sense in business but it but it it's is it hurting the legalization movement is it hurting the reform movement i guess is the question i have for you bruce I don't. I don't think the idea of, of interstate commerce and the fact that these states are um, moving ahead in 
theory, if not in practice. Right. Um, I, I think it's having a, a, the exact opposite effect. I think that, um, you know, again, for, for many years, there was the assumption that, you know, the states are the, the, the um, you know, the nursery, the, the, the cradle of new projects in, in democracy. And, and we're trying out legalization and eventually that'll burble up to the federal level and Congress will naturally pass legalization act and things will be better. It hasn't happened. I think interstate commerce could be the next step that states have to take on their own, sort of pushing past the existing line um, to make progress happen. And I'm not sure how that will happen. It could be, I mean, you know, back in 2013, after Colorado and Washington legalized, um, there were a lot of like delicate negotiations or delicate talks that went on between um, Washington, Colorado, their state, essentially governors, um, and the Obama administration. Like, how are we going to handle this? Because it's still definitely federally illegal. And so the Justice Department essentially came out with a memo that said, all right, we're going to let you proceed with this, but here's here's the line. You can proceed, but don't pass the, go past these lines. I think something similar um, might, you know, help propel a little more progress in terms of interstate commerce, in terms of just say, let's say Washington, Oregon, and California got together and presented something to the Department of Justice and said, hey, look, we have a real problem with the illicit market. Um, this is one way we think could, that could really uh, uh, give us a, a, a strong tool to combat that illicit market. Let's just lower the barriers between those state lines, you know, the Columbia River and then, uh, you know, that line in California that I don't know is geographically marked, but it's there. Um, I don't know. That's what I think about interstate commerce. I'm I'm very excited about the possibilities there. Yeah, just like COVID slowed everything or sped some stuff up, I think that also interstate commerce could do the same thing. If we look at if the dormant commerce clause was used to allow for interstate commerce, we could have the equivalent of incubators and think tanks and focus groups and all of these people coming together to brainstorm on because uh, you have you've got some people in states that are saying we've got fire and then you look at it and like man that's a meme right there that's poop soup in a jar what are you doing if we could get rid of the the barriers and and these these ridiculous state borders and and actually allow for a single cannabis cup where all of these innovators could come through we could have some really really good cannabis um, and maybe allow for Blue Dream to come back because it's not a high yield or it goes into um, the rainy months or whatever. And, and so they base these cultivars or strains on what's going to be a higher yield. And I don't want to pick my choice based on the farmer making the most money. I want to pick it based on what terpene profile works best for me. And I think that having an open interstate commerce will allow people to come together, figure out what's the best way to do it, where and how. And then network like a true co-op to be able to produce the best, um, you know, there's some, a guy running around with a, a sweatshirt said the weed's supposed to taste good, <laughs> you know, like that, it, that's so, it, it, it's a meme. It's almost funny that he has to wear that on a shirt, but it's, it's standard. It should be good. And I believe that interstate commerce could be that thing to really kind of bring everybody together to have that connoisseur cannabis that we all deserve. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that was a perennial challenge uh, when I was editing at, at Leafly um, was the fact that we wanted to get information about the best products to our readers. That was like goal number one. People need more information about what they're buying or what they could buy, what's good and what's not good. One of the huge challenges and frustrations was that because the industry is so fragmented state to state, you could write about what's amazing in California right now. And people just across the border, I mean, in Oregon, I mean, obviously if you're just across the border, you can drive. Um, but you know, people on the West Coast would be like, wow, that sounds amazing. How can I get it? Well, you can't, you gotta go to California to get it. Or you know, likewise in Massachusetts, if they got some new product in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and we're raving about it, uh, you can only still obtain it in, in in Massachusetts. You know, Even though there are, you know, obviously companies and brands that move state to state now and not all of them do but like, like the hash say, strips in canada we can rip a piece of hash and put it in your joint but you can't get it here like right. that 
Great. Well, whatever it is, like it's it's um, it is a, a real um, a real problem, and it's something that you know I can't think of another industry that that faces that. That's right. That's right. No, oh, it's it's so unique, guys. Um, we we all know that. But one of the the things we talk about interstate commerce, and this is one of the things that is a bit hypocritical because there is already interstate commerce in the cannabis industry. People are using the, they're manufacturing, the, the genetics are coming across state lines, whether they be seeds, they're turning it into concentrates, they're turning it into edibles. It's the same recipe in California as it is in Massachusetts, as it is in Michigan. This is happening. It's, they're replicating the same uh, product in other states. So, but what's hurting is the fact that flour can't be across state lines, right? So once again, the enlightenment of our government needs to happen because they, they have to understand that this, there's already interstate commerce going on. And and by the way, you feds aren't getting a piece of this yet. Yeah, that's the FOMO yeah. we should be sending is like, you're missing out on some money. If you right. can ship seeds, how come I can't ship a clone or a seed right. plan? It makes no sense. No and then sense. You go all the way to the end with the finished product, like what's the difference? That's exactly right. Hey, hey, Bruce, I'm going to tell you something. Um, th there was sure. an article, um, you, you pointed out a great article, and I want to get to that in a minute. But mm -hmm. the uh, in Massachusetts, the Talking Joints memo produced by Chris Farone um, put out an uh, interesting memo, or I guess it was an article this week, on uh, the testing, the inconsistencies of testing, and, and some of the, uh, oh, let's just say less than uh, legal activities that go on between the testing labs and the producers of the product uh, to enhance those testing results. The the you guys at Leafly, I'll never forget. You went and you you tested different products and you uh, you know you kind of reported on it. It was a great expose. Once again, it's part of the learning process about how delicate the plant's makeup is. You can't. You, you use the word clone, uh, Josh. You can't clone cannabis. You just can't. It, it impacts everybody differently. And, and every time that a, a batch is tested out of this area, let's just say, it's not going to be the same as being tested out of this area. And, it, and it, so it, what, and by the way, our regulators and our legislatures all want it to be clean and make sure we don't have mold. And I, as a, as a consumer, I don't want to have mold in it either, by the way. Not that I even knew what mold was back in the 70s or the 80s, but I didn't care back then. I was just happy to get it then. Now you can clean it up. You, know, you didn't like the mold on those stems you were smoking, huh, Jimmy? That's right. That's right. That's right. No, we used to, I take the with seat. the fire you've got. You've got 100 percent mold now, whether it's indoor or outdoor. Those mold spores are going through every single filter right. in, in everywhere. So everyone in the Northeast has got mold now. Yeah. And we figured that out, Bruce. I don't. You you remember 2017 when the Eastern Oregon uh, fires were blowing through, and then people were getting popped, and they're like, "What's going on?" And I think you guys probably wrote on that, and we're like. It's the, it's the fires pushing the mold spores through, creating yeah. havoc for everybody. And then they just go, mold to gold, we're going to blast this. And then now you can dab it safely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, lab shopping has been a problem. You know, that's a problem that cropped up early here in Washington State um, with with uh, folks going lab to lab and see who can, who can, you know, result the highest THC level because that's the biggest bang for the buck the consumer wanted. Um, and I, you know, there's a... There's the classic two prong attack on that one is uh, simply to ed continue to educate consumers um, that it's just it's not all about the THC it's it's about so many other things that go into the experience. Um, but I think there's also the, there's also a way in which um, I think when we all started up these these regulations and these industrial systems. Um, we thought that uh, we think of labs as being sort of angelic players in the system, you know, where no, well, of course they wouldn't, they wouldn't pipe their results, you know, they're, 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 oh. they're decent folk, they're scientists. Um, they're robots. And, and, you know, we, we learned early on that, no, actually like the, there's a, the, a profit motive involved here and, and that can really skew things. And, you know, I've, I've seen some reports in the last year where, where folks are advertising like, you know, THC percentages in the forties and, and such. And I'm like, 
you, 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 I'm not sure what you're doing to a, to a plant to pump it up to THC in the forties or fifties, but like, that's, that's no longer a plant. There's no room for cellulose anymore. Like what is, what is going on there? That's, that's not working. Um, right. So yeah, it is a, it is a, uh, it is, it is, a, it is an issue. And I think that um, again, it's, it's, it's so early in terms of consumer right. knowledge about right. these products. That's um, right. And, and has been, um, you know, this, this, you know, we've had a forced ignorance about it for 80, 85 years of, right. of, of prohibition, you know? Right. And, and, and let's, let's educate some of our consumers. You can go into a dispensary, you can look and see what has the highest percentage of THC and you can make your buy because that's what's been going on now. But we all know those that have, you know, been around it and talked to scientists and growers and everything. It is the terpene profile that dictates the impact of that THC and the other cannabinoids in the plant. And that is probably more important than the percentage of THC. But, you know, people are looking, I want to get the best stuff to get the best high. Well, you know, maybe that's not what you should be looking for. You want to get the best result of what you're looking for this plant to do for you. And, and you wouldn't and I, want to get on a motorcycle going a thousand miles an hour without a steering wheel and terpenes are the steering wheel. So you're going to right. get somewhere fast, but how do you know where you're going to go? Yeah. Bruce, why, why is it in Washington state when I go to my, my local dispensary or no matter where it is, mm -hmm. how come they, they don't have terpenes yet? You go to Nevada, a relatively recent state, and they, they buy a lot of stuff based on terpenes. And yet in Washington, they give me happy, you know, relaxed, or THC based on the lowest price. So I could filter on price and filter on THC. Why after so long is a state like Washington falling behind? Huh. I think that's one where, you know, that, that's got to be essentially consumer driven. I think, I really do think that that's got to be, that has got to come from consumers demanding to know about terpenes, about the terpene profile of the product they're buying. Um, I, I don't. I, I don't want to uh, sit here with a hammer and bang on our our local alcohol um, control board in Washington State, but they, our regulators, do a good do a, do their best. But they are they have never really been set up um, to regulate cannabis proactively. I mean, they were from the start an alcohol regulatory body. That's what that's so that's what they do well, um, and. They really, I, I think with cannabis, they're all about, um, you know, in, enforcing age minimums, which they should. They're all about, you know, enforcing some other things. But really, they don't get involved in um, demanding that uh, testing labs, you know, give a terpene profile with every run they do. And so I think that that unless that comes from the consumer telling the bud tender, telling the retailer, Hey, I just, I need, I want to know more about what you got going on here. Um, it's not going to happen. I mean, look, we've been trying to get uh homegrown rule, homegrown <laughs> rules relaxed here in Washington for years. Like we have, we have, pretty, you know, we got higher priorities at a certain point when it comes to um, uh, regulations and, and the state legislature. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think, I think again, it's a, it's a uh, consumer demand kind of thing. And we, you know, at, at Leafly, we tried many different ways of talking about terpenes. Um, but I think the industry still has a long way to go in terms of coming up with the language to talk about terpenes and the experience and connecting those things. Right. Um, because it just, uh, we don't have the words yet, you know. Right. Hey, I, I was think at Kingsbury is going to finally overturn that felony on home grow this year in Washington. So I think that bill is going to be received fairly well if they don't approve it this year, hopefully Good. next year. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. I mean, look, just to, to cap that, that uh, thought, I mean, I, you know, I'm a, I, I like beer. I'm not a, I'm not a beer connoisseur, but you know, there's right now there's a, there's a, a craze, at least in my corner of the country but for hazy IPAs, right? Juicy, hazy IPAs. And those are very blunt terms, but they're the words that I use when I go and look for that specific product right now. It would probably embarrass somebody who actually knows something about beer, but I'm a, a very like mainstream connoisseur, and I think we need 
simpler terms and more powerful terms to, to describe terpenes. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, by the way, lemoline, just pronouncing them is a challenge, um, let, let alone spelling them. Um, you guys are both from Washington State, and we haven't even talked about, wasn't there a, a news item this week about the, one of the Tri-Cities opting in to cannabis now? Um, is, it, is it Pasco, Washington? Is that a city in Washington? Okay, so that's in our news show. It's on at six o'clock. I just want you to know I spotted it. They are now, so a lot of states, when they go legal, allow the local towns to opt in or opt out of whether they want to have dispensaries in their town. It isn't tied to the actual vote for that particular ballot question or anything like that. And in Washington state, that that city, Pasco has decided to opt in to the cannabis dispensaries. And that was pretty, that was a pretty big deal. I thought that because if you look at New York, a lot of the towns, once they go legal, they go, no, not in our town. It's the NIMBY factor, right guys? Isn't that what they call it? The NIMBY factor? Yeah. Um, not in my and, backyard. Yeah. And, right, not in my backyard. And yet here in Washington state, is this go? when I'm looking at that and I say, oh, maybe this is a trend. You know, maybe the New Jersey, the new market in New Jersey, those that have opted out will now start to opt in. Uh, you know, more and more towns in Massachusetts now are looking at the taxes that are generated in the various towns that are. That's carrying. what you're. That's the thing you got to focus on because you're making sure. it sound like they they pulled their head out of their ass in Pasco and they didn't. What happened was, I believe, is that they were incentivized because a they weren't going to get the money and b I think they're literally paying up to two point five million dollars. Don't quote me on that to opt in. So uh, Bruce can maybe give us more. Sorry, info. I I am I am out of the I am out of the loop on the past. Not covering the beat anymore. It's Sorry, not his beat yeah. anymore. I, I did it. I found. It. Hey, this is big. Give me credit for that. Props. <laughs> Pasco's we a teeny news town. Had this story. <laughs> but here's the thing. Pasco's a teeny town, but it is it is um, conservative country because it's all about farming and and everything. So that's a big deal because they uh -huh. have. There's a thing called um, Red Mountain in Eastern Washington, and it has a wine mafia. I use the term loosely, and they don't want cannabis anywhere. And so they use that NIMBY, the not my backyard thing, to push people out and say cows, you know, or uh, cannabis stinks. Not the cow shit that's everywhere, right. but the cannabis. And so it's hilarious. It's hilarious. In it's it hilarious. In it, they're using anything they can out in Pasco, but the fact that this conservative area of Pasco is saying yes is huge news at a very, very teeny local level because it's just saying, hey, it's acceptable. It's money. Let's do it. Who cares? Nobody's pushing back. So all of those things at, at the the heart of the country in middle America is going to start expanding and there's going to be a lot of people going, damn, I didn't think that um, Utah would have it or we're in um, Washington state and Ferndale up north um, and a couple other places don't serve alcohol on Sundays, but they'll have cannabis. So yeah, there's yeah. some of these these areas that um, are opting in that don't like alcohol that are saying yes to cannabis. And that's the takeaway is that nobody's pushing back because no one cares. Right. We had a viewer from Utah in the chat room earlier today, too. So it just gives you an idea. We've got that kind of reach. Hey, Bruce. I love talking to you. I really do. I don't care if you're not on the beat anymore. You have such a great perspective on this industry and the history of it. And I so appreciate you coming on today. And I really hope we get a chance to uh, continue this because uh, I've always enjoyed your work. Absolutely. I love, I love talking with you, Jimmy. And uh, I love, you know, I love talking cannabis. Like, honestly, uh, you know, uh, 10 years ago, I got in, I got in on this to this uh, sort of fell into it when, you know, Washington, legalized and I happened to live in Washington and I looked around and said, what the hell's going on here? And, you know, the more I, I did my research and wrote my book, um, the more I just, I just love covering this subject and thinking about it and writing about it. There's so many different just aspects of life that get teased right. out of this. Um, right. We were talking the other day, you and me, just and, and everything from, um, you know how cannabis affects sleep to the idea of stigma uh, and the so, like the social racial history of the United States gets so mm -hmm. entwined with all of this. All right. um, I, I, I really love it. I, I can't get enough of it. There you go. Well, let's stay tuned to Pro Cannabis Media because hopefully 2023 is the year that the rest of the country picks up on what we're doing here and and share, like, and subscribe to everybody. That's what we want. Bruce Barkhart, thank you again. Uh, we will keep in touch and I, I'm looking forward to the next book that comes out. Awesome. Great talking with you, Will.
You bet. Last half hour of Green Rush Live coming up next. Don't go away. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Are you looking for the next great cannabis business to invest in? Then you need to check out the MJ Bulls podcast. Hi, I'm Dan Humston. Join me each week as I speak to both cannabis entrepreneurs who are raising capital and cannabis investors who are investing capital. Our 10-minute episodes are perfect for the busy investor. Start listening to the MJ Bulls podcast today, wherever you listen to podcasts, and who knows, maybe you'll discover the next cannabis unicorn.